Hey everybody, welcome to the GMG Review. Today I'm taking a look at Zona Alpha, Salvage and Survival in the Exclusion Zone from Osprey Games. Um, this is Patrick Todorov's 64 page, um, I guess, roadside picnic slash metro sci-fi game um, where you are going to an exclusion zone where some type of crazy event has taken place. There's dimensional space-time effects and, and, and sort of like things happening. Uh, potentially like chemical spills it's it's basically gone very very wrong but the government's you know kept the place closed and there's neat artifacts you can go in to get so if you ever play video games like stalker uh, they're based on the old Russian sci-fi novel roadside picnic where there's basically people going into these zones to try and liberate black market artifacts and take things back that that kind of defy reality and when you're in there things are bad there's there's zombies there's radiation there's all kinds of potential chaos, monsters, whatever you can possibly imagine, basically. Um, it's a wonderful book if you haven't read Roadside Picnic. I think it's being developed into a series or a movie right now as well. Um, and of course it was developed into uh, Stalker, basically paid homage to it as a video game. Um, and so did the Metro series, Metro 2033, uh, has some similar sort of themes to it. So if you're looking at like a post-Eastern Bloc um, kind of sci-fi skirmish game, this should be up to to, to the task, I think. This is a 64 page book. It's the, from the um, Osprey War Game series, the Blue series, which means they're always under 100 pages. And uh, it's very well written um, from the point of view of a concise miniature war game. It uses action economy as a currency, basically. So when you're first forming your team or you're playing a one off game, um, the core mechanics are based around a number of actions and every model having an action. How many actions you have is how good you are. So th there's not a lot of like basic statistics. Your gear basically is your statistics. Um, how many times you get to act per turn is your is your training level, and then um, you can become wounded, lose actions, and 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 so on. Um, it's D10 based, which means it does have a little bit more depth of range for its uh, um, you know stat lines uh, when you're trying to hit a target. Basically, when you have your your basic stat line, uh, most people are, are are trying to roll equal to or under something. So. The general rule is that a high low is bad, 10 is always a fumble, and 1 is always a success. Now sometimes D6s are used usually for zone effects um, when it's just you don't need 10 things. <laughs> you don't want to you don't want to throw the curve off. Uh, D6s do get thrown around. But for the most part, 2 or 3 D10s is, is all you really need, and then a handful of D6s. Um, crit successes and failures cancel each other out. Uh, so like for instance, if you rolled a critical success and a critical failure at the same time, if you're rolling something that requires two dice, they both count as normal rolls. So <laughs> they, they, you, they don't trump each other basically. Um, but sometimes you get free actions from crit successes. So, uh, regardless of the task, difficulty, or modifiers, one that was always a success, and the model gains a free extra action. This action uh, must be taken immediately and does not roll over to the next turn. So that's pretty cool. Um, there's kind of an exploding D10, but it's, it's based on the action economy of the game, which is pretty cool. Um, however, if you roll a 10, you're automatically unsuccessful, and the model gains a pinned counter. Pinned counters are basically non-wounds um, that interfere with models going around and doing things. And like I said, critical mix. In the event, unmodified ones then show up in the same rule. Say when make a range attack, they cancel each other out. There's no additional benefits. So you don't gain the pin counter, but you also don't get the extra action on top of that. Um, and then activations and actions. In the course of a single game turn, when a player's units will be activated once, they get to do one, two, or three based on their combat experience. It's if you're a rookie, you're trained, or you're a veteran. Um, and stats and modifiers can affect your roles. So typically this is a 3x3 three three to 4x4 four four game. Um, the, although the introductory scenarios do recommend a 4x4, four four, I think I'm going to try it on a 3x3 three three and see how it goes. Uh, it's a nice tape measure, your battlefield train, tokens and templates. Not a lot of tokens really required, you just need activated markers, alert, pinned and wounded markers. So four different types of token, or if you have just four different colors of beads, you can do, I don't know, black and white for activated, um, red for alert, uh, pinned could be, oh geez, I don't know green or orange and would it give you red um, and then you need some templates now the templates described here are basically the old gw template set uh, it's a five inch template a three inch template and then a eight by three inch at the widest part template which is what the old flamer template is from gw from 40k so it's not saying just use those templates because they're easily <laughs> available um but i i'm pretty sure there's about a billion copies of those templates kicking around somewhere in the world uh, and if you can't find one, just go to your local game store and look in their rummage bin and be like, hey, do you have any of these like kicking around? And I'm sure they will either give you one or sell you one um, because most of them probably have a shoebox full of them sitting at their gaming table somewhere. 
uh, something to, to count your turns and then some miniatures. And that's that's the basic ins and outs of the essentials. Like I said, it's a nice streamlined game, um, and you don't have to worry too much about the core components required. It's more about designing a nice table that fits the theme, and then having some core rules to throw down with it. So, the vitals. You got some stats. You only have four stats that are really necessary. There's your movement. It's how many inches you move across the table. Your combat ability. Uh, the average human is five because it's a 50% chance on a D10. Your armor, so how much you can uh, withstand damage. Basically, if you get hit, you're trying to when you hit with a shooting, you're trying to make an armor shrug to see if it it, it bounces off you or not. Um, and you're rolling equal to or under your armor stat on a d10. And then your will, and that's the same thing. Most human soldiers have a will of six. Uh, you're trying to roll equal or under. It's to represent effects where like something's either you know scaring you or uh, something bad's happening. I mean, mind control, you know, weird dimensional effects, whatever that kind of stuff is. And then your weapon stats have a range, how many inches um, you can shoot it. Firepower, so the um, number of dice that you roll when you fire it, and then damage. And that's the negative modifier to your armor, so it'll reduce your armor. So, so a lot of things are armor zero, um, or sorry, damage zero. And that's to mean the fact that your armor is basically as effective against them as it's going to be. I have some good examples. You can see here, here's Major Timor Bach. He's from the military faction. And there are factions in this game too. Uh, they're more providing you with like a theme and who's going to ally with you or not than they are like in-game effects because a human's a human's a human in this game. Um, they've got two wounds, which means they can be wounded twice before they die. Combat experience, they are veteran, which means they get three actions. And then six inch of movement, combat ability six or less, military body armor, providing an armor value of six and a will of seven. And then a couple skills here, leader skill uh, and the unload skill. They can spend two consecutive actions on a range attack um, against a single target and it adds two bonus dice to its firepower roll. So unloading basically just means shooting all your bullets as fast as you can. Uh, but then after using it, you have to spend extra reload the weapon. Some of its equipment, military body armor, that's why it's got armor six and it counts as an obscured target when in cover. Uh, hand grenades, so it's two hand grenades, they're small blast. Um, you get some late, then three three equipment slots because you basically can only carry so much stuff based on your training level. Uh, so Major Timor Bach is carrying a laser sight, uh, some night optics, and a med kit to do extra things. And then um, is carrying three weapons as well, which is an MP443 Grac pistol, the range of 12, um, and it can also be used in melee with the M stat. It can be used in melee. Firepower one and damage zero. So it rolls one dice to attack uh, equal to or under its combat value, and then damage it modifies armor by nothing. The AK-74 assault rifle, though, is a 1 to 36 inch range, firepower 3, so rolls 3 dice, and is damage 1. And a hand grenade, 1 to 18 inches, firepower 1, uh, and it's damage 2, and a small blast template. So it's 2 damage per model and small blast template. That's pretty cool, so there's an anatomy of, of a stat line. So you can see, there's a lot of stats, not, not tons to keep track of. It's a nice, lean game system as far as, like, get your models on the table, get them acting, get them moving, do stuff. Um, and then core mechanics, so it's initiative and alternating activation, so you're trying to roll equal to, or sorry, you're trying to roll under um, your opponent on a d10 to get your initiative. Uh, the initiative die roll will be modified by the number of players currently pinned units, so your minus, uh, your plus basically the number of pinned units that you have. Which I think is a kind of neat mechanic, you can do some non-lethal damage to your opponent and make it so you kind of have the initiative, you're, 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 um, you're getting momentum over them in the course of the game, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, and the one of the initial roll then passes their option to their opponent if they deem it tactically, tactically advantageous. So um, if the opponent has you know far far less models, you might want to actually let them go first, uh, and you're in an adv advantageous position because I'd activate them then. Because again, it is an action economy game. Um, each unit can activate one time per game turn. When activated, a unit can perform one, two, or three available actions. Number of possible actions is determined by their combat experience, as I said earlier. So rookies have one action, hardened have two actions, and trained models have three actions. When activated, a player can select one of their uh, units to perform various actions. Uh, below is a list of available actions. So you can aim to get plus one to your combat ability when shooting um, subsequently. And if it goes turn to turn, then you can aim and then shoot the next turn. Uh, alert costs two actions. Unit may hold one action reserved to interrupt an opponent's activation. So at the end of an action, you can interrupt them to perform an action as well. Um, you can shoot, aim, prep, throw a grenade, whatever. Um, you can make an attack, a range for melee attack. You can climb, counting every inch as two inches. Um, you can inspect, similar to aim, this action is used when a model is in line of sight and within 12 inches of a suspect uh, location, such as a hot spot zone or a mission objective. A lot of times the hot spot zones, you don't actually know what they are. So you're you know there's something there. It could be like a nest of like wild dogs or weird rat swarms or zombies. Um, but you have to go and inspect to try and figure out what they are. Uh, if you go into it, then it's going to activate automatically if you get too close. Um, but you can inspect from afar and try and try to get to reveal itself beforehand too. 
Um, and this action allows the player to add or subtract one from the hostile zone table roll for that particular location during this turn. It only applies in the same turn. So basically, if you inspect it first, you kind of modify it. You can, you can make it more or less dangerous when you actually go in and, and activate it. There's also a thing called throwing a bolt you can do later on. Take an action if you're within, I think it's grenade range, so 18. You can basically chuck something into the zone, try and rile it up to, to get it to reveal itself. Uh, you can jump, which is a uh, jump horizontal gap two inches wide for an action. Jumping beyond two inches requires a um, prior move action and a skill check. Uh, and the target number is their will stat. And then moving, you can move your move stat in inches and prep and throw a grenade. It counts as a single action. Rules for grenades and Molotov cocktails are less in the armory. Rally to remove a pin counter. Uh, removal is automatic at one action per counter. It does not require a will check. And then recover. Similar to rally, this is essentially standing up and getting your bearings. Um, in the event of a fall, an environmental or scenario specific effect, you can recover. Basically, it means getting up from being prone a lot of times, but there could be other effects in the missions and stuff that, that it generates. Reload your gun if you don't have any ammo. Use or interact with action. It's just like a catch-all for, for whatever it is you need to do in the mission. And then complex stats and skill checks. They'll usually give you the skill and you have to roll equal to or under it based on whatever your rating is. Uh, you can see 360. Terrain blocks line of sight for real. And movement is dynamic. Basically, you and your opponent should agree on what the movement's like. A lot of lovely art in this, too. I forgot actually to mention the name of the artist, which I should do because I'm so often... Uh, not able to know who they are. Sam Lamont, uh, any award-winning illustrator, concept artist, and game designer. Uh, has worked on Doctor Who, Total War Warhammer, Call of Cthulhu, and Star Wars. Very cool. Uh, I actually really like this muted, muted artwork. Cover obstructions, soft and hard cover, so th the usual things. Uh, soft cover is minus one of the attacker's combat spell and plus one of the defender's will. Um, for, for when you get shot, you might freak out. Hard covers, plus one to the defender's armor stat, minus one to the combat ability, and plus two bonus defender's will stat. And then hardened cover, which means like sandbags or weapon emplacements or whatever, are minus two, plus two, and plus three. So minus two to hit, plus two to your defender's armor stat, and minus three will. So the better your cover, and you have to agree with your opponent prior again what kind of cover you see on the table, um, the more your stats are basically going to be changed. Squad cohesion. Oh, sorry, and also elevated attacks. Um, it reduces the level of cover by one. So if you have the high grounds, um, you're, if you're basically in cover, if you're obstructed and soft, then it becomes no cover. If you're in hard cover, it becomes soft cover. If you're in hardened cover, it becomes hard cover. Or hardened becomes hard. Um, and then squad cohesion. It's designed to be a skirmish game and played controlling a squad of individual soldiers, specialists, and characters. However, there's an occasion where a unit is composed of multiple models. In this case, squad cohesion is common ability. Um, because the squad is trained to act together, um, they all activate at the same time. Squad cohesion means models um, in a multi-model unit cannot move further than one inch away from each other. So this often happens with zombies and stuff. You get a group or something, like four zombies show up, they have to be moved as a squad. Um, and then you basically move, you think of it as a chain. They all do the same action, so they'd all move, they'd all shoot, they'd all do whatever. Uh, a lot of times with the, the zone monsters and stuff like that, their actions are based on the threat level of the zone. Typically you're playing threat level one, which means the bad guys are going to have one action when they activate. Um, if you're playing two or three, they could have two or three actions as well, which makes them more dangerous the deeper in the zone you go. Part four, combat and wounds. So you can see we're skipping right ahead here. So um, range combat, you have to spend at least one action to perform the attack, be in line of sight of the target model, and then have sufficient range with your weapon. If you're not, you can't shoot. Uh, Permission is allowed, however. And the attack roll, you try to roll equal to under your combat, number of firepower dice for the weapon, uh, make an armor save, you reduce it by the damage of the weapon, and then try and roll equal to under if you're the target. And then melee combat's basically the same thing, but when you're attacked in melee, your opponent has the opponent to react by also attacking back and defending themselves. If they do that, both um, the attacker and defender roll a number of dice equal to their um, whatever their melee weapons give them. And you compare the uh, the what should I call it the um, the the scores. So melee combat's considered simultaneous, and the defender does not have to expend actions to fight back if they don't want to. You can just take the damage too. Um, and then any dice uh, that you get as successes, you can use to reduce your opponent's amount of successes. So basically, whoever has more hits, you can either cancel them out and come to a draw, or if you have more total success than your opponent, you you cancel out their hits and do hits yourself. Um, and at the end of the round, you compare everything, and then the opponent makes uh, the saves appropriate to the number of hits they take. And then combat results are the same for uh, the same process for both melee and shooting. Uh, if you just do a uh, an armor stat in melee, then if you deflect it, it's just a miss. If you deflect a hit with your armor in shooting, it becomes a pin marker instead. Uh, and pin markers are things that again reduce your initiative for the initiative roll at the start of the turn, um, and can make you less effective as well. 
successful hits do not cause wounds. Um, they have enough power to stun. That gives you a pin check. If you fail a will test, defender rolls d10 and against their will stat for every round of ranged combat and deflected hits. Um, it's just one basically for every round of ranged combat with deflected hits. You're going to save them, not the number of hits. Taking into account any modifiers for cover, so that's why the cover gives you a will bonus. Um, if the defender fails the check, place a pin counter on them. If they pass the check, they carry on as normal. Again, for every failed will check from a round of ranged combat and deflected hits, place one pin counter. For multi-wound models, um, this target number is further modified by the number of wounds and casualties they've sustained. This number is negative modified to the finish will stat. And a miss causes no physical damage, does no effect. Um, if you take a wound, though, uh, you go down. Most models have one wound. Veterans typically have two. So like hardened and, and rookie models will only have one. Once you're wounded, you're just dead. If you are wounded, you stay on the table, but you have a bunch of penalties to your stats. Uh, and then deadlocked uh, and withdrew in melee combat. In the event of an attacker, defender, tie, or no defendant combat result, the combat, uh, combatants are considered deadlocked, and the melee combat continues the next turn. A model with sufficient actions wishing to withdraw from a deadlocked melee may only do so after the unit's made a free melee attack. Defender rolls or armor saves for any hits, and then it's considered a dodge. Um, so if you make your saves, then you dodge out, and you're okay. Uh, but if you opponent does any actions, they, they... Oh, sorry. No, they get the free melee attack, actually, so they don't have to spend an action to do it if you try and walk away. And then kicking them when they're down, a melee attack against a pin model get a plus two bonus to combat ability in the first round only. Should the defender survive the initial attack, they're considered to be alert on their feet and fully engaged in self-defense. Uh, range attack on pinning it suffers a miles to their combat ability as they're making all efforts to be in cover. So if you're pinned, there's a slight benefit that makes you harder to actually shoot at because you're, you're freaking out and you're trying to hide. And then wounds. Wounds are awful. If you have a single wound, you're not dead, but you're badly, badly hurt. A uh, model that's been wounded and put out of action but is not healed uh, before the end of the mission must roll on the battle scars table to see if they um, have a lasting injury. A woman wounded and out of action model that's wounded, uh, again, in a different round of combat while out of action is considered permanently dead. So if you're wounded out of action, you get wounded again, you're dead. Um, any equipment, weapons, or armor they have goes in their crew pool and can be used to equip other crews. So you actually scavenge everything off your dead people, which is pretty cool. Uh, and so yeah, can, you can keep kicking people when they're down basically. And in multi-wound models, if you take a bunch of wounds, or a wound usually, because you only have two, you get a wounded shit and you get to basically reduce all your stats by half. Uh, and there's a minus one penalty to your will stat. So the wounded model remains uh, on the table, but uh, they move at half rate and they have half their combat ability. You're not half will though, you're just minus one. And of course your armor continues to function because it's not subject to how healthy you are. Pin and rally, in order to remove a pin counter, you have to make an action to do a rally. When a rally removes a pin counter, a uh, pinned unit's eligible for cover bonuses um, and receives an additional bonus to their armor stat from all the direct fire range web attacks as long as they remain pinned in behind cover. Uh, it's considered to be hunkered down for protection, taking full advantage of cover. They're basically trying to crawl inside their own helmets. <laughs> you can spend um, med kits to do two things. Uh, if you do take med kits, though, you gain two pin counters. So if you remove your wounds, that's great, but then you become pinned. Uh, they will not work on a model hit and wounded multiple times in the same round. Note if a model receives two wounds and has, no, has two med kits, they replace both the wounds with four pin counters, but two is the maximum number of wounds that can be dressed in a single round of combat. So basically if a person's out of action, if they're downed, you could walk over the med kit and then put the wound back on them so no longer down, but they have two pin markers. They're basically rolling around trying to get up. They have to clear their pin markers. Um, a multi-wound model you could bring back to unwounded, basically, if you had two med kids, but they'd have four pin markers on them they have to remove later on. So it's kind of a laborious process, to because remember, you're buying off those pin counters with um, actions. You'd have to spend, even a veteran who is brought back from basically downed would have to spend an entire turn plus one of their actions unpinning um, to, to get rid of all their pin markers. And then range attack summary, to conclude this, every time a target a range attack uh, there's basically these successes. Range attack success, you're either wounded or casualty. If it's a deflected, possible pin counter. And if you missed, you just missed. Um, and what was the last one? What kind of pin? I think there's a pin on mic. I can't remember what you can do. Yeah, you just get the cover bonus. You can't really act while pinned. I guess you can. Uh, a key that cannot be burdened with one of the four pin counters. With the exception, oh, that's right. With the exception of defending itself from melee combat, a unit cannot perform any other actions until all pin counters are removed. I didn't think you'd do anything while you're pinned. Because otherwise you just like take a pin counter and then get all the cover bonuses and walk around with it. But they thought of that. And then there's the armory. So um, the armory is, think of like, again, a stalker tech level. You're not gonna have any like improvised crazy guns, uh, no like harpoon launch or anything like that. It's typically anything you could get today in like Eastern Europe. So we got uh, knife, claws, and teeth for all of the monsters. 
machetes and big claws and teeth, very big claws and teeth, <laughs> pistols, magnum pistols, shotguns, and SMGs for the melee weapons, because they can all be used in melee. Um, it's just like close range weapons. And then uh, for the rifle tables, assault rifles and battle rifles, I guess the, the idea here is we're talking about the difference between something like an AK versus something like, more like a ZK-15, but like a Steyr AUG, where it's like got a slightly longer, longer range um, and a reduced rate of firepower, but like a higher caliber, uh, higher caliber bullet. And then um, you got your support weapons, so like chemical uh, sprayers or flamethrowers, a 40 mil grenade launcher, a light machine gun, uh, RPGs, rocket launchers, uh, anti-armor or anti-infantry, and then like a sniper rifle, an HMG, and a mortar. And of course there's names given for all these things, but like they don't have to be those things. You don't you don't have to use those specific Eastern Block weapons. They can be whatever you want, wherever you want to set this game, because it's 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 got a theme, but it doesn't necessarily have like the it's not rooted in any one sort of place. Or time. Uh, grenades, Molotovs, flashbangs, smoke grenades, hand grenades, and satchel charges, all of which have their own keywords and a huge list of uh, keywords here, so like reload. Uh, you have to reload it every time it fires. Limited ammo, how many times you can fire it over the course of a game. Support weapons. Um, if you're carrying one, you can only move one inch when you move because you're carrying a giant weapon. And then crew served, you can't move at all. Uh, small blasts and large blasts, just what size blast it produces. Flame templates burning. Um, if you're if you're touched by template, must keep rolling armor until they succeed or they lose a last wound or, <laughs> or just die. And then penalties for melee weapons, unless the weapon uh, lists melee as a range. Uh, melee attacks with a ranged weapon in melee suffer minus two to their combat ability. So you're basically like fighting with the butt of the rifle as opposed to um, trying to like uh, use it up close. And then training features and area effect weapons, um, getting like a soft cover bonus, uh, giving bonuses to your armor save and stuff if there's blasts, body armor, types of body armor, you can have BDUs and foul weather gear, salvage and improve, improvised body armor, civilian commercial body armor, military body armor, advanced body armor, mimetic camo, so like your, your predator stuff. Um, and then military exosuits, your power armor as well. So if you can take the tech level as high as you want, obviously you're not starting with any of that stuff when you build a crew, but you have the option for it in the game. And then things like uh, if you have a tough and hide or shell, if you're like a big crab monster or something, use, it says basically WYSIWYG, use, use the appropriate rules for body armor that you think would fit the monster. Uh, and the same thing for armor readings for drones, robots, and light vehicles. Uh, special rules like indirect fire, um, the shadows for indirect fire, and then we're on to skills and abilities. Um, so some models start with skills, so you can pick skills for veteran and hardened players usually. Uh, so things like being a doctor, cutting fuses, uh, being hard, <laughs> which basically means that like there's a fine line between bravery and stupidity. It's um, so his name is Tom Sizemore, Black Hawk Down, where he's just like literally walking around the Humvees, like not even trying to hide, and just never gets shot until like right at the end of the movie when he takes one in the neck when he's in the when he's in the Humvee. Um, hustle, being quick, knife man, being a fighter, being a leader, scrounger, steady hands, unload, and wrench. Uh, so these are all like different. There's, there's uh, two, four, six, eight, ten, ten different skills you can use. So not a huge amount, but it means that you've got the ability to personalize some of your models as well. Um, equipment and equipment slots, so how much people can carry. Obviously this can change based on um, certain gear. Starting players can select three items from the base equipment list when they're making their crew leader. Other crew members start with two. Um, rather than weight restrictions or carrying capacity, each character in Zone Raider has multiple equipment slots. Players can select and assign one item for each equipment um, slot. Multiple uh, of the same item can be equipped, like med kits. The number of slots can be increased over the course of the game, uh, with campaign advances and special items like chest rigs and load-bearing vests. So your leader typically gets three, everybody else gets two. And there's tons of gear, so binoculars, electric juice, which is like a methamphetamine-like cocktail you can drink. Uh, gas masks, med kits, red dot sights, detectors for searching all uh, anomalies, like a catch-all term, toolkits, uh, light vision goggles, hot loads of ammo for plus one damage, scopes, a chest rig, which is pretty cool, you get extra grenade and equipment slot you can carry, uh, load bearing vest for two and uh, two, and then under barrel grenade launcher, adds a 40 mil grenade launcher to your weapon, Kevlar plates, plus one armor rating, and uh, heavy weapons reload adds five to the ammo. And all of these, you can see, you, they cost value zone script, and that means that you're gonna buy those over the course of the, um, the campaign. Uh, character creation, so again, um, the basic stats for, for whatever your, uh, your, your like, training level is. So the crew leader's um, in charge of the squad. They're always a veteran, movement rate six, combat ability six, military body armor, will of seven, and they're always class of veteran. And the next, like, uh, ranged melee, uh, weapon and melee weapon and two grenades of any type and three inches of the basic equipment list. And that's your leader. And then once you're done that, 
you can have like your basic sort of like dude who's going to be the uh, the guy the guy that's that's leading everybody, and then you can buy the rest of your team. Um, and you have what's called crab roast. I I don't I'm not even going to be able to say that properly, uh, but it's how it, it measures your squad's threat. Um, so zone crew's crab roast is equal to the total uh, available actions among its members. Uh, normal starting crew would have twelve. Leader takes up three, so you have nine to spend basically. Um, and then they cost whatever their actions are. So rookie is one, hardened is two, veteran is three. So my starting squad, for instance, I've got um, two veterans. So my leader and another veteran. Because I've got like my, it's like the 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 ranger they've hired to basically take them into the zone. And then uh, I've got two trained guys. So that puts me at six, goes to ten, and then two rookies. So a six man team to start off with. And I've got a variety of training levels in the actual in the actual force. Um, when you equip them, they can just be given um, their, their basic stuff. So a uh, rookie can have a range weapon, a melee weapon, two grenades, and a piece of equipment. Um, same with these guys. They start with civilian body armor. The rookies start with improvised body armor. So range weapon, melee weapon, two grenades, and a skill, and two pieces of basic equipment for the hardened guys. And the veteran can have a range weapon, a melee weapon, two grenades, two skills, and three pieces of equipment. So you can mix and match and kind of customize your characters. Now, um, all the factions uh, have like a little unique perk that you get from them, and then they have their ally matrix of kind of like how they feel about each other. So the Zone Enforcement Military, uh, they get a 20% discount on purchasing new weapons and can recruit rookies at 25% in later games. So when you when you build your team, you're, you're based to, on that 12 action economy. When you recruit new people later on, they cost you script that you earn throughout the course of the campaign. Um, and they get a 25% discount for rookies because they're inducting people into the army. Scientists get a 25% discount when purchasing medkits, tools, uh, gas masks, and binoculars at the stalls and can hire two hardened recruits at 50% the normal price later in the game because they basically go around hiring mercenaries because they're, they're scientists. Uh, bandits, um, they always receive one free Molotov cocktail when visiting the stalls. They just get one for free. Uh, it's all about the money. And they start with two free doses of electric juice and a chest rig because they're, they're like bandits. They steal things. Um, later in the game, they can hire one veteran at 25% the normal price. You can always recruit rookies at 50% the normal price because money talks. Uh, independence, they receive a free gas mask, med kit, and scope, and then 20% basic discount on um, items at the stalls. Independence can always add hardened recruits for 30% less the going rate. And then cultists, oh geez, if you find a cradle of crazy, it's best not to stir it. Um, they get... A free set of night vision goggles and two med kits, and they receive a 20% discount on all advanced equipment items and stalls. And when hiring new crew members uh, later in the campaign, their first veteran rookie recruit is free. Because people just join the cult because they're so convincing. Uh, you can work as the traders, and then um, because of this, they're always looking for reliable security. Uh, they get a permanent 40% discount on all items in the stalls and can hire veterans at 25% discount. So no, no free gear really, but they like reliable security, and so they don't pay a lot for what they have. Now you gotta pay faction dues. Um, whenever you play a game, you have to pay 10% of the total value of all salvage artifacts uh, is deducted to pay your dues to your faction. Um, if you don't have it, this includes the stuff you're trying to put in your retirement fund because the, the end state for the campaign is you're trying to raise 10,000 rubles so everybody can retire. And then allies and enemies, uh, relationships in the zone come in three players, allied, enemy, and neutral. In zone alpha, anytime you um, uh, encounter members of a different faction, there's certain animosities. So if you're allied, then at some point your organizations are pledged to assist each other. Uh, they avoid attacking each other. So allied crews tend to cooperate in zone ruins. Um, in order to break an alliance and attack an allied crew, a crew leader must pass a one-time will check at difficulty four on a D10, uh, subtract four from the rules, roll of the result. Uh, this role does not need to be declared to other players, however, it requires two actions to make. If successful, the player may uh, then act in whatever manner they deem expedient. If attack is made, the two particular crews are crashes enemies for the rest of the campaign. Uh, neutral, it's live and let live, but there's no restrictions for fighting. And then enemy, you fight like junkyard dogs. Um, anytime an enemy crew is encountered the missionary, a mission objectives and salvage become secondary and the destruction of the crew is the only objective. All objectives and hotspots are ignored. If a crew leader wants to override this antagonism, they must roll one time wheel check at difficulty two. Uh, success means they uh, act normally for the rest of the game, otherwise the mission objective and hotspots can only be pursued by the enemy crew and it's right after they're dealt with. Uh, below this table of alliances, so like the military is allied with the scientists, their enemies to the bandits and the cultists, and they're neutral to the independents and traitors. And it kind of goes down from there. And then how do you put a mission together? So you're going on zone runs, there's a 2600 square kilometer area which is the exclusion zone. 
Uh, for Forest Parody, in terms of challenging with balanced games, uh, I'm of the opinion most tabletop gamers are capable of fair-minded enough to create their own scenarios. As outlined in Section 6, zone salvage crews are built on Cabrost, the number of uh, actions per turn, um, and then your threat level basically determines how many K in value you get to pick from your squad. So at threat level 1, you get 10, uh, 12, and then up to 16 potentially for threat level 3. Uh, all players who want to go into the zone must build and build crews of various combat experiences that equal to that level. So you think about your crew as your stable. Hiring people doesn't necessarily make your crew bigger. You're going to deploy the same number of actions into the zone when you play a game. And then mission area, the zone threat levels. Um, so you've got low level threats. Yellow is two uh, medium threat levels replaced a bit further in, and red is three high threat levels in the deepest parts of the zone. Um, crew leaders are uh, able to choose where they explore. So the more you want, basically, the more powerful you get, the more you're going to want to up the threat level for your games that you play because there's more rewards potentially, more objectives on the table to complete, and more things you can do. Um, your turn limit is always going to be, it depends on your table size. So for a 3x3, three three, it's 4 plus D3 turns. And then for large tables, it's 6 plus D3 turns. Um, the initial objective is always going to be from a list basically later on. And then triggering objectives and hotspots, uh, you can bolt toss in them, like I said, and then everything's got some kind of weird zone hostiles potentially in them. Whenever you roll a 6 for the uh, the triggered mission objective, there's also one of the weird, um, crazy uh, anomalies that takes place. There's a whole list of zone hostiles, everything from zombies to rabbit dogs, bandits, mutants, large mutants, vermin, um, and their weapons are all outlined here. They follow basic AI. They never go outside of 12 inches of wherever their objective or their, their uh, anomaly is and they will use basically the number of actions equal to throw over the mission you're playing. So the deeper you go, again, the more dangerous the monsters are gonna be when they show up. And then looking for salvage, that's what you're after. So you go into the zone to get some salvage, you're gonna roll D6 uh, based on the threat level and it gets better the higher it is. So if you roll a six on threat level three, it's a 2000 ruble plus one roll on the advanced table, uh, sorry, the advanced equipment table and special items table. So you get tons of money plus like tons of potential stuff too. Uh, anomaly effects can be super terrifying, um, and they can they can really mess you up. Uh, if the world checks unsuccessful, anomalies trigger in all models within touched uh, by the hot ra spot radius, take a damage to attack. So the anomalies like weird floating balls of light, or time starts going backwards, or your body starts growing hair, I don't know, into your brain, like whatever weird thing is going to happen, you have to try and um, you have to try and uh, pass a will check to to resist it. Uh, and then this, you can pull two artifacts out of an anomaly, however. Once an artifacts have been removed from the anomaly, the area goes inert and it's no longer viable. And the artifacts can be crazy, crazy cool. So you can get everything from like super high valuable artifacts, when it's anomalies, um, to also like you gain a movement bonus, an armor bonus, or a will bonus, your stats can increase. And of course, you also have environmental hazards. Um, at the start of each zone run, roll a single d6 on the table and apply the result. Uh, feel free to ignore it if you don't want it. So it could be overcast, there could be a sudden darkness where it just goes dark. Um, overcast, no effect. Uh, rainstorm, all movements minus one, and range attacks are at half range. It can be sunny or high radiation. Strike one from the turn limit. All salvage rolls are at times two, which is pretty cool. And then you get your advances in battle scars. So crew credit, basically, um, crew credit goes into a pool, which I think is kind of cool. Your individual models don't necessarily gain um, advances on their own, which means if you have like a really cool character that gets battle scar and dies, you have to worry about that so much because you can apply them later on. So if you survive the mission, you get a crew credit. Kill enemies, get a crew credit. Salvage a hotspot, get a crew credit. If you do the mission objective, you get a, a crew uh, thing for your um, credit for your crew as well. And it's advances. And then you go in the advance pool and spend them. Um, for every 10 advances, a crew that can improve one of their crews or their own's model stats by one. Uh, and then you can get additional equipment slots. For every 10 advances, you can add an equipment slot to somebody or buy new skills for every 15 advances. And that pool basically just gets reduced. So whenever you do something cool, it goes into the pool, and it's just a group XP that you can spend on everybody to enhance their stats or however you want to do it. And then promotions. Um, this is a particularly cool one. For every five missions a player model survives, they're promoted to the next experience level. So it's just automatic. You've just learned enough by being in there and not dying that you, you go to the next uh, higher training level. A model stat line has previously been approved by advances. The promotion benefits do not apply in that particular arena. Um, promotions do not apply to veterans. Their stat lines improved by advances only. So you can only buy stat increases for them. They don't, they don't level up and gain new accents. Um, and then yeah, battle scars can come out of uh, dying and, and, and being, being, being shot up. So you can be obsessed, uh, slowed down, become squeamished, uh, lose will. And on a six, it's just a, just a flesh wound. For remodeling your crew that was put out of action during the game, you had to roll that d6 in the battle scars table. 
Uh, and then you got the stalls where you go and spend your money. So there's all your stuff you can spend money on. All the equipment uh, stated previously. And then on top of that, you can recruit new people. So it's 1,500 recruit a rookie, 2,500 for a hardened uh, person, and then 4,000 for a veteran. And again, the various factions allow you to reduce that as well. Uh, and then linked missions and end goals. Put together your linked missions. You should roll and see what you want to do. Um, so if you get stuck, here's some mission prompts. And these are just good mission prompts. So like roll a d6 uh, and decide if you want to be looking for an action, an item, or a location. So I roll five. I'm looking for a vital component. And that just gives me the story of whatever my objective for the mission is. Uh, and then we get our um, end state for the campaign. Uh, if you raise 10,000 rubles, you retire, which is awesome. Uh, and then finally, the, uh, there's other options too. Like if the retirement fund's too simple, you have to retrieve 12 zone artifacts of any type. Um, this job, and like you could also, th if you want to theme whatever your zone extraction is by your, uh, your faction, you do that as well. And then you got three introduction missions here. The, the gyps, the red gypsy three, uh, it's your introductory zone run. Um, and you're, you're going to be able to play through these on four by four tables to try it out. So the first one is threat level zero. It's just got some, some hostiles on the table. Uh, game two is threat level one, uh, and you got two hotspots. And then game three is uh, threat level two, and it's uh, it's in the yellow zone. You get one mission objective and four hotspots. And that's it. It gives us a nice crew roster for putting your sheets down, and that is our nice, concise 64 pages of Zona Alpha. So like I said, um, it's a great, I, I really like how concise this game is. It gives you a good template for playing the game. It doesn't say you have to play scenarios any one given way. It just gives you how to generate an objective marker and what could come out of the objective marker when you go to kind of like look at it and, and get your salvage. Um, and it's, again, it's miniatures agnostic and we're going to have some fun with it. So I'm going to play through the um, the the core missions, I think. Uh, hopefully with Jay. I think Jay's paint up some models would be appropriate for this. But I'll get my factions ready. I'll get all my monsters and stuff ready as well. Uh, and we'll give it a go for at least three games because I think it's going to be a fun um, side project for doing uh, just a neat little sort of like stalker skirmish. We have tons of tons of terrain already for this stuff, so it's just really getting some crews together. So big thanks for Osprey sending me this to check out, uh, and for you guys for watching. We'll see you for more GMG reviews in the future. Thanks, Tom Ash. Have fun. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you uh, want to support the channel, of course, like and subscribe, and hit the little bell below to get notifications when I post future content. I do post stuff seven days a week. Uh, if you want to support the channel um, further, you can, of course, buy a t-shirt through Spreadshirts, um, buy a measuring gauge or objective markers from Deathbird Designs, um, or, of course, most importantly, there is Patreon. Patreon is what makes all this possible, uh, keeps the lights on, pays for the studio costs, pays for the equipment, model costs, and everything else, and most importantly, um, puts food in my kids' bellies and a roof over their heads. Uh, big thanks to everyone past, future, who supported me. Uh, I do this stuff because of you guys, and of course, I will continue doing it as long as I can.